For too long, standing on a red carpet being worshipped by photographers and fans was an impossible dream for most transgender people who were accustomed to few opportunities and negative portrayals in Hollywood. In movies or television shows, trans actors have a line or two, many times they're murdered. For decades and decades, they didn't care about getting it right. And then trans men, we don't even exist. For many trans stars, the first hurdle to making it in Hollywood was overcoming prejudice in their everyday lives. How I was bullied and chased home from school every day by groups of kids. But it's important for people to realize that that violence exists. This isn't just something that Hollywood is talking about, this is real. With trans women of color making up 50% of all LGBTQ murder victims, daring to dream has never seemed riskier or more important. You're just on high alert all the time, and that's a hard way to live. But thanks to these fierce and fearless trans men and women who kept dreaming in spite of overwhelming obstacles, today, television is leading the way, creating opportunities for trans performers and fostering acceptance for the transgender community at large. We're seeing an authentic curiosity in the lives of trans people that is starting to break through those stereotypes. Shows like Dirty Sexy Money, Orange is the New Black, Transparent, Pose, and Euphoria have all helped the world see transgender characters as fully rounded human beings, not the cardboard cutouts depicted in previous decades. I really think that that's what a lot of trans and non-binary actors want, is just to be accepted. But there is still much to accomplish. Now, a new generation of trans actors, writers, producers, and directors in TV are using their platform to continue pushing for even more inclusivity and calling for new standards in storytelling. I'm really excited to see more mainstream, non-binary, and transmasculine representation because there's so many important stories to be told. Exclusive interviews reveal the long journey from marginalized to mainstream for trans men and women in front of and behind the camera and the struggles they still face for acceptance off screen. I brought all my pain into the ballroom of being that dark-skinned girl. This is True Hollywood Story, Transgender in Hollywood. The journey to representation for transgender performers and creators has been decades in the making. Prior to the 2000s, trans characters were played by non-trans or cisgender actors and reduced to stereotypes as victims, killers, or mentally disturbed deviants in films like Dog Day Afternoon, Dressed to Kill, and The World According to Garp. Transgender women have been the butt of the joke, only looked at as sex workers, are criminals, we still aren't seeing trans men on TV all like that. I've had issues, you know, in shows where people would just constantly misgender me. I was like, I need help to find jobs where I don't have to disclose that I'm trans. For a long time, I did background work. Television depictions of trans characters were often played for laughs on sitcoms or continued the movie trend of trans victimization on shows like CSI and Law & Order SVU. Transgender actress Candace Kane experienced that trend firsthand. Most of the roles that we had auditioned for were drug dealers, uh, prostitutes, or um, victims. The idea that trans people are just men in dresses and makeup, that's where abuse starts, that's where discrimination starts. Until very recently, opportunities for trans performers were few and far between, so Candace took what she could get. When I first started, there were no trans auditions. So I would hear a call for a drag audition. And once I got the part, I would tell them that I'm trans and um, I hope that's okay. So I didn't really have an option until the past 10 years. Candace Kane's road to stardom began on the island of Maui, where the actress was born on August 29th, 1971. As a child, Candace always knew she was trans, even before she learned the term. I was teased and bullied my whole life because of who I was. But I have amazing family and parents. I always try to go into every situation with a positive attitude and hope for the best. While Candace found acceptance within her own family, the outside world was a very different story. 
My junior year in high school, I got called into the office. They said, you're getting kicked out of this school. She said, you got kicked out because you're gay and you have some real issues. Like the first time that the outside adult world had done something to make me realize that this isn't a happy place. Candace transferred to a new school and found refuge performing on stage. Our theater did a production of La Caja Full. I was one of the chorus girls. And so my first aha moment was when I put on the leotard and the tights and the heels. I was just like, wow, this feels so good. And it gave me the strength when I left high school to just leave and go to New York City. By the early 1990s, Candace had made a name for herself on the New York City drag scene, one of the few places a trans performer could find work at that time. Candace began to publicly transition and started landing small roles in film and television. But she quickly realized that stereotypes about trans characters were still alive and well when she went to audition for a role on CSI. My first big role was to play a murder victim on CSI. It was originally for a drag performer to do a Britney Spears-esque style performance on stage, and then she gets killed in the men's bathroom at the stall. Candace knew that the story didn't track and took the huge risk of speaking up. I went up to the director and I said to her, listen, I'm trans and no trans woman would ever go into the men's bathroom. And so I said, I can't do something that a trans person wouldn't do on camera. And they said, okay, we're gonna put you in the female room and we're gonna drown you in the toilet. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I guess that's what we'll do. The experience empowered Kane to keep speaking up for herself and the LGBTQ community. Those years of quiet activism paid off in 2007 when Candace was invited to audition for a pilot that featured a love triangle between a married man and a trans woman. In the past, all the trans roles would go to cis women. And so I thought, since this is a primetime network, that they probably won't go for the trans actor. But I got a call back, and then they said, you got it. Show up <laughs> next week for the table read. After 15 years of struggling as an actress, Candace landed the role of Carmelita on ABC's Dirty Sexy Money. So I walk into the table read and there's Donald Sutherland and Jill Clayburgh and Peter Krause and Billy Baldwin. And I was like, oh my God, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was gonna be. Dirty Sexy Money premiered in the fall of 2007, making Candace Kane the first trans woman in history to play a recurring role on primetime network television. Unfortunately, I can't involve the police with this because I'm the attorney general and you're not my wife. For them to cast a trans woman to play a trans role on this show was kind of incredible. And to be a love interest with a Baldwin. I heard that growing up, like, oh, he's such a Baldwin, like from Clueless. And, then, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, hello. People tell me all the time, the funnest, sweetest, most normal relationship on the show is between you and Carmelita. With that one groundbreaking role, Candace Kane had officially struck the first blow to the glass ceiling for trans performers everywhere. Candace was our celebrity before we were allowed to have trans celebrities in the mainstream. She was our celebrity. At first, it was about a gig, and then I realized that it was about pushing the fabric of society forward. It was an incremental change that people can see, and I think she definitely became a model of possibility. She really was one of the first ones to do it. People had seen Dirty Sexy, realized that it was possible to write a trans character, and then slowly trans parts started being introduced more and more. And that was a really amazing milestone for trans in Hollywood. And this is gonna open up so many opportunities for so many people down the road. But while the needle for trans characters on TV had moved from exploitation and stereotypes to the beginnings of true representation, there was still a lot of work to be done. We still are in a place where we're including trans bodies only to check a box. We're beyond this point of seeing trans characters as sort of sprinkling diversity into a project. But it's past time that we become part of the mainstream narrative.
the, the audacity to pursue her dream. Before Laverne Cox became a household name on the Netflix hit Orange is the New Black, like many trans performers, Laverne had to overcome humble beginnings and heartbreaking discrimination. I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, and I was raised by a single mom, and I have an identical twin brother. I was bullied and chased home from school every day by groups of kids. Me needing to express myself was so much about my gender. And I had dreams of moving to New York and being an actor. And so having something that I loved to do kept me alive as a kid. Laverne studied acting at Marymount Manhattan College, graduating in 1996. Cox wanted to become a professional actor, but didn't know it was even possible until she saw Candace Kane. I had been acting for a very long time and not getting very far. Candace has been a huge inspiration to me as an actor. Her historic moment of being the first trans woman to have a recurring role on a primetime television show in 2007 was pivotal for me. Like, I believed that it was then possible. And the next year, I booked my first Law & Order, and that happened because of her. Things go missing from people's lockers whenever he's working. Just three years later, Laverne became the first transgender person to produce and star in her own reality series, VH1 makeover show, Transform Me. Most of us have felt like there's a person inside of us that is not reflected on the outside. Okay. It's all about loving yourself. Transform Me led to the actress being cast in the role that would change her life and career and launch the next phase of a representation revolution in Hollywood. When I got the script, I knew that it was bigger than me. I was hoping that maybe we can spark some conversation and hopefully some change in the world. Laverne's casting as transgender inmate Sophia Bursett in 2013 not only broke new ground in Hollywood, it made history when Cox became the first openly transgender performer nominated for an Emmy as Best Guest Actress in a Comedy Series. I don't think I saw a black trans woman laugh, you know, or smile on TV before Laverne. The show did not shy away from exploring the rarely seen realities of being transgender. Listen, Doc, I need my dosage. I've given five years, $80,000 in my freedom for this. I'm finally who I'm supposed to be. Do you understand? It brought an aspect of humanity to black trans folks that we haven't seen before. You had, like, you know, white folks in the suburbs, like, I love that show. I love Sophia. That never happened before. Laverne Cox had become the breakout star of the first hit show of the streaming era and America's first mainstream trans icon. And in 2014, she achieved a stunning milestone, becoming the first transgender person to grace the cover of Time magazine. The cover of Time is iconic, and this was the first time in 90 plus years that an openly transgender person had appeared on it. And that is a vehicle for feeling validated that you can point to and say, if you don't understand, this is me, you know, and I'm real. I got an email from a 12-year-old young boy who, who identifies as a boy but loves to dress in girls' clothes. And his mother gave him a copy of, of Time magazine. He said, this person's like you. She was part of a whole shift going on in Hollywood and culture. Laverne's success put an unprecedented spotlight on the trans community, bringing attention to critical issues that the community had been facing off screen for decades. She still understands that she has a platform and she uses it so responsibly. The issues of transgender women are women's issues. Every time Laverne speaks, every time Laverne is on screen, it is a win for the trans community. It definitely sped up the momentum of the trans movement in Hollywood. We were all really focused in on making sure that people understood that we were here to stay. In 2016, Laverne used the full force of her platform to raise awareness about how trans women are discriminated against in the criminal justice system, producing the documentary Free CC. I'm producing a documentary called Free CC about um, a transgender woman of color named CeCe McDonald who spent 19 months in a men's prison for defending herself against a racist and transphobic attack. The documentary illuminated a stark truth. Half of all transgender people experience some form of sexual violence and trans women make up 50% of murder victims in the entire LGBTQ community. There have been many times in my life that I've wondered, as a black trans woman, is this the day that I'm gonna be taken out? Free CC not only garnered critical praise, it helped to facilitate CeCe's release on January 13th, 2014, where Laverne was waiting to greet her. 
The success of Free CC inspired Cox to undertake an even bigger project in 2019. The first all-trans feature documentary, Disclosure. Disclosure is a documentary film that takes a look at the history of transgender representation on screen, on film, and on television. We want people in the industry to yes. see the film and hopefully change how we make films, how we cast films, how we tell trans stories. There are a lot of really talented and amazing people in front and behind the camera that are trans that deserve to have a fair shot. Coming up, off-screen battles. Even though folks in Hollywood are taking a little bit more of a risk with telling more trans stories, they're still not going far enough. And later, pushing the envelope. Once I knew Janet Mock was writing and would be directing on Pose, any fear that I had about the trans representation completely disappeared. By 2014, Laverne Cox was permanently changing the conversation about trans representation in Hollywood. Because of this show, my story has gotten to influence the lives of so many people in a positive way. But while roles for trans actors were finally expanding, opportunities behind the camera were still few and far between. Even though folks in Hollywood are taking a little bit more of a risk with telling more trans stories, they're still not going far enough. There are so many transgender men and women that can be behind the camera telling their own stories. Writer and producer Joey Soloway was one of the first non-binary people to have a voice behind the camera when Amazon picked up the pilot for their groundbreaking series, Transparent, in 2014. The show featured Jeffrey Tambor as a college professor transitioning, based on Soloway's own experience watching a parent go through the same process. When I got that phone call from my parent coming out, I definitely was empathetic. And I definitely had like the little voice in my head which was like, this is gonna be a great TV show. Creator Soloway and transgender writer Our Lady J were joined by trans director Silas Howard, shattering another Hollywood glass ceiling. I wasn't aware that I was the first trans director for TV uh, on Transparent. I wouldn't have been hired if it was left to the studio. It was the show that pushed because to bring people in behind the camera was a big, big important factor of that show. I get to explore all of these themes around characters that are in my world. But there was one area where the show was less groundbreaking, casting a non-trans actor in the lead role of Mora. It's problematic, mainly the idea that trans people are just actors, that are just men in dresses and makeup. While the lead role may have gone to a cis actor, the cast included top trans performers in supporting and guest roles, including Alexandra Billings, Hari Neff, and Trace Lizette. So I came to the role of Shay through an audition, and I was scared because it was my coming out party because I'm playing this outwardly trans character on TV. Like many of her trans sisters, Trace worked as a stripper to pay the bills in between acting auditions, where every day held the potential for violence. You're just on high alert all the time, and that's a hard way to live. I wanted to free myself from all of that. But stripping also meant a big, steady paycheck. So Lizette turned to friend and mentor Laverne Cox for advice when the transparent casting opportunity came up. I don't think that the transparent camp even understood what I was risking by accepting that role. Here I am taking a job that could lead to a better future, but I'm outing myself and people are gonna talk. So that was really scary, but I think that's just taking that leap of faith is um, wanting more for yourself. Trace took that leap of faith, accepting the role on Transparent. By season three, Trace left stripping behind when her character went from guest star to recurring and became the focus of a groundbreaking storyline with Mora's son. It was such an understated performance and so beautiful in these ways where Trace was just a beautiful woman. So someone like Josh on the show should be attracted to her. As their relationship evolved, the show's creators wrote a fight scene for the couple that ended up being one of the most powerful moments in the entire series for the trans community. I see right through you and I'm not your adventure. That is so primal and real for trans women because every girl I know can identify with being that for a man. And 
It's something that needed to be talked about for a very long time. It was expanding this idea of being able to love a trans person and that we're deserving of it, and also made people empathize with the heartbreak when people decide that they can't just because of our gender. But while the cast was pushing the envelope on screen, during its fifth season, real life drama was brewing behind the scenes. So it was really heartbreaking how Transparent had to come to an end due to the allegations about Jeffrey Tambor being inappropriate, uh, abusive, entitled uh, to the women on set. In November 2017, news broke that Tambor had been accused of sexual harassment, assault, and inappropriate behavior by several members of the cast and crew, including Trace Lizette. Tambor categorically denied the allegations in a 2018 Vanity Fair interview. It's encouraging to see that I was heard and believed and supported. I did what was right for me with what occurred to me and my body. I'm just doing my best to push forward and um, put my energy into projects that will make my career flourish and not be defined by that unfortunate moment. All we are ever thinking as trans actors most of the time is, how can I be a good guest so I can be invited back? We don't usually want to rock the boat when we're on set. So when she spoke up, so did I. And I will continue to stand behind her. I just hope that the industry doesn't penalize us, the folks, for revealing what's really going on in these industries. For me, the takeaway from the whole Transparent Saga was that there were things being done that had never been done before. And I'm grateful for it, you know, and I think it was the necessary step on the timeline of trans representation. To watch this evolution of worlds that I've been around come into the screen, there's just this joy for people to have access to stories like this. Coming up, powerhouse producer Ryan Murphy comes calling. Pose really was the first time on a mainstream level that we had actual trans people playing trans roles. This was huge. And later, the ballroom scene was like a subculture of the black gay community. It was a way in which we took some ownership over our sexuality and our gender presentation. By 2017, television had made important strides towards greater trans representation on and off screen. But when A-list producer Ryan Murphy took up the baton, acquiring the rights to Pose, a pilot script by writer Steve Canals, the movement went finally and fully mainstream. It's an evolution for sure of that conversation about authentic storytelling. Set at the height of the AIDS epidemic in New York, Pose became the most ambitious and audacious trans representative project to date. A massive ensemble drama based on filmmaker Jenny Livingston's landmark documentary, Paris is Burning. Paris is Burning is about the ballroom scene in the 80s. The ballroom scene was like a subculture of the black gay community, particularly in New York City, where we would have these balls, these competitions. It was a way in which we took some ownership over our sexuality and over our gender presentation. The documentary explored competitions held at venues like New York's House of Latex, where walk-offs were fierce, trophies could top 12 feet, and prize money could put a cool grand in a winning diva's pocket in a single night. That movie really depicts what trans people went through at that time. And so Paris is Burning is part of our history, it's part of our culture. While the legacy of Paris is Burning was undeniable, because it was written and produced by a cisgender creator, Ryan Murphy and his team wanted to give the trans community a chance to finally tell their own story their way. But first, they needed a powerhouse to anchor the team. They found it in the form of writer, director, and trans advocate, Janet Mock. This is the piece that I've got in front of me. It was the piece that made you famous. The headline is, I was born a boy. I actually Even did not write that piece. So in my introduction of my book, I talk about how that piece was so problematic. And it's problematic because we don't let trans women say who they are. We need to just follow trans women and let them say who they are and believe them when they say that. She's an icon in the community. She showed us that our stories are important and that people want to hear them. When Ryan Murphy came calling in 2017, Mock signed on to pose as a writer and director, making her the first trans woman of color in either role on scripted television. 
Janet is someone who I have been a huge fan of well before I ever met her for the show. She was an icon well before she ever worked on Pose. So you have Steve Cannell, who is, is a gay man of color. You have Janet Mock, who's a trans woman, coming together with Ryan Murphy's like resources and reach. That is what Paris is Burning missed. It missed having us telling our story. Our stories and our experiences in our lives matter and that they have real impacts. So often trans people are not included. Once I knew Janet Mock was writing and would be directing on Pose, any fear that I had about the trans representation and how it was gonna go in the show completely disappeared because she is a voice that has been, I believe, preparing all this time for this moment. With the creative team in place, casting became the next hurdle. The challenge of casting an all-trans ensemble and hundreds of LGBTQ supporting players and extras the script demanded was daunting. But casting director Alexa Fogel was determined to succeed, knowing how critically important Pose would be to the trans and LGBTQ communities. I had been told that the ball community was very uh, closed and that I was gonna have a lot of trouble getting into the community. The opposite actually proved to be true. Fogel hit pay dirt when she found trans actress Haley Sahar, who landed the role of Lulu. I come from ballroom. Being able to pull from that storyline that is my own to embody Lulu's character has been incredible. The role of ballroom alpha queen Electra Abundance proved more difficult to cast until Fogel returned to the ballroom community and found Dominique Jackson, one of the stars of 2016 reality series Strut, which followed trans models trying to break into fashion. I knew the most difficult role was going to be Electra. I knew about Dominique. And this has never happened to me before in my career, that when she came in, she finished the first scene and I was speechless. For me, it is art imitating life. Dorian Corey, Avis Pendavis, Pepe La Beja, Crystal La Beja, those were the women who built this foundation of the ballroom scenes. I called Ryan and said, I think I found her. I always heard that there's no talent pool out there. So we spent six months and it was just the most amazing, joyful group of people I've ever encountered. And sometimes people would be so good, but wrong for the part Then I would say, well, I'm gonna write you a part because you're so amazing. Angelica Ross was one of the actors who benefited from Ryan. time on a mainstream level that we have the largest cast of trans actors, actual trans people playing trans roles. Not only that, we've got trans directors and writers and producers. This was huge. This has never been done before. And so a lot was riding on it. Would it sink or fail? Coming up. Part of me wanted to ask, why Candy? Why not you? Do you think you're that special that the violence won't end up at your front door? And later. When I got to be in Hustlers, it was huge for me. The girls were like, wow, we can dream bigger. By June of 2018, the trans community was poised to make its biggest representation leap yet with the premiere of Ryan Murphy's Pose, a dazzling celebration of the 1980s New York ballroom scene set at the height of the AIDS epidemic. The ballroom culture is about choosing life in the face of the darkest kinds of consequences. So that's winning. That's real internal joy. And it's great to be able to play that. It is bigger than just a show. We're speaking to a you know, specific part of the community and we're trying to raise awareness and try to just open hearts and minds. And it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. And I'm excited, excited to be a part of it. Pose was an instant hit with audiences and critics offering an important opportunity to shatter myths about trans and LGBTQ talent and raise the bar for inclusive storytelling. Right now, as of today, we've hired 140 
trans or LGBTQ actors and crew members to make this show, which is by far the record. And it's such a joyful, great thing because this is a community of people who've just been starved for opportunities, usually in movies or television shows trans actors play the best friend or they have a line or two many times they're murdered but in this show they're the leads they're the heroes they're the heroines they win it's an amazing thing to see mr murphy has gave us actually validation this is what when you have power when you have the ability when you have privilege you should do with it season one of pose garnered multiple award nominations including three golden globes a historic emmy for billy porter and the GLAAD Media Award for Best Drama Series. The show's massive success launched its ensemble cast to superstardom, including actress and advocate Angelica Ross, whose fearless portrayal of feisty frenemy Candy Ferocity won her legions of fans. Candy's story is a lot like mine. Candy is a dark-skinned, black trans woman who gets overlooked a lot. So I brought all my pain into the ballroom of being that dark-skinned girl. Now cut that music back on, bitch. The category is called lofting. It is a dance category for actual dancers. Why are you always reading me the riot act, pray tell? You go out of your way to put me down. I don't have to put you down when you're always in the bottom. Pose presented an unflinching look at the realities of being trans including a gut-wrenching storyline for Candy that illuminated a stark truth about the violence trans women of color regularly face. Ryan Murphy just calls me up, like, okay, Angelica, I'm just gonna rip the Band-Aid off and tell you. We want to talk about the violence that happens against, you know, trans women of color, and so Candy is going to be killed in the fourth episode. I had such mixed emotions. Part of me wanted to ask, but why? Why me? Why Candy? And why not you? Do you think you're that special that the violence won't end up at your front door? There are still trans women today in 2020 who do not come outside unless it's under the cover of night because they are afraid. There are still transgender people being killed all over the world. Knowing that Janet Mock and Our Lady J were in the writing room, I had no anxiety. Janet Mock is not just a writer. She's an advocate. She knows the sensitivities around certain things. Those sensitivities included taking a dramatically different approach to the way Hollywood had typically portrayed violence against trans women, choosing to keep Candy's beating and strangulation murder off screen. This Pose episode is important because people have to know about it. This is happening at least on a monthly, if not more, basis but it's important for people to realize that that violence exists. This isn't just something that Hollywood is talking about. This is real. The American Medical Association has declared transphobic violence to be a national epidemic. More than 130 transgender people have been murdered in the U.S. since 2013, and at least 20 black trans women were violently killed in 2020 alone. Playing out candies death was literally the hardest thing I think I've ever done. And before even shooting that, I walked into the funeral home with a piece of paper that had all the names of all the trans women who had died that year. And as I then read off each name, I began to cry. And so, it was palpable. I knew that it was going to reach people in the ways that it did because I could feel it in the room. I could feel. It breaks my heart that so many trans women of color every single year are murdered by toxic masculinity. The episode also represented a quantum leap forward in mainstream trans representation. My prayer was that mothers and fathers would see this performance and take advantage of whatever time they know they have left with their gay and lesbian and bisexual and trans and asexual children, or you just don't understand them. But you don't need to understand them to love them. 
We didn't see her die because she was trans. We saw her mourned and celebrated because she lived. And that was the shift in the focus. And that's what they got right. I think that storytelling is one of the greatest ways that we can entertain people and educate people and inspire people and hopefully inspire them to do more than just watch television and film move, but to actually like do some action and, and help trans communities specifically. Coming up. I'm really glad that I was able to pioneer that and be one of the first out and proud trans teens in media. In 2018, the monumental success of landmark series Pose set new standards for trans inclusivity in television. Now give them some music! As the trans community continues to build on that momentum, the push towards a Hollywood that no longer needs labels is gaining steam. I think right now we are on that trajectory. Generation Z, they're starting to understand this expansive idea of gender. While scripted shows have gotten the lion's share of credit for shifting attitudes about transgender acceptance, reality television has also played a pivotal role with shows like GLAAD award-winning Strut, I Am Kate, and most notably with the groundbreaking 2015 TLC trans youth series, I Am Jazz. The show followed the evolution and transition of a transgender child into their teen years, showing the world for the very first time what that experience was like for her family. I thought I was pregnant with a little girl. I was carrying just like I was with my daughter. And when I went for the ultrasound, no, nope, it's a little boy. But Jazz corrected us all. When she could articulate who she was, she said, Mommy, I am a girl. And this was at two. And I think like a girl, but I but I just have a white body and it's different than you. We wanted to educate. I believe it is so important for as many trans youth to be on TV as possible. When Jazz was younger, there was no one for her to idolize or look on TV and say, that's me, I'm like that person, I feel better now. The series was the first to document the early days of the trans journey and not only gave hope to trans kids and families, it inspired trans actress Josie Tota who was cast to play a trans character in the reboot of Saved by the Bell to embrace her true self. I know that I Am Jazz, the show, was very important to you in your journey. Uh, did you and Jazz get to kind of chat at all about that? You know, it's so funny because Jazz just texted me. I love her so, so much, and she's such an inspiration to me and such an incredible human being, and I'm so grateful that I have a relationship with her. As an ally today, I'm like, I wish I could have known more. <laughs> So I could have been an even better ally back then and more of even a role model for LGBTQ plus uh, siblings. By 2016, young trans actors began appearing in scripted shows, including HBO's Euphoria and Netflix's The Politician and The OA. I don't think I knew any trans characters on TV when I was growing up. So I'm so glad that the industry is moving in that direction because I want more trans people to be able to tell their own stories on their own terms. Ian Alexander was one of the first trans-masculine teens on screen. Laverne Cox tweeted about the open casting call. They're looking specifically for someone who's 14 and 15, Asian American, and a trans male actor. I have never seen something so specific to me before. So I went for it. I had not considered being a professional actor, I didn't know that that was possible for someone like me. I've talked to a lot of my transmasculine friends about differences. I'm really excited to see more mainstream, non-binary, and transmasculine representation because there's so many important stories to be told. Continuing to broaden transmasculine representation, actor Theo Germain joined the cast of Ryan Murphy's 2019 Netflix hit, The Politician, playing non-binary Machiavellian campaign manager James Sullivan. My whole life changed kind of like I'd won the lottery in a day. I read the sides and they didn't have anything to do with gender identity and I thought that was great. 
This looks like some high school dude who's a dude who's probably kind of a jerk. And that sounds awesome. Recent studies suggest that over 25% of Gen Zers identify as non-binary, and more than 150,000 identify as transgender or gender non-conforming, reflective of a trend away from narrow definitions of gender identity among teens and young adults. If I had had more actual trans representation on stage and on screen when I was growing up, that would have made me feel so much more confident. Seeing yourself on screen, it just feels good and affirming in a way that I think is beyond words. While Gen Z is at the forefront of pushing Hollywood to abandon labels, trans actors of all ages are beginning to appear in roles that have nothing to do with gender identity a hopeful sign of progress on the road to equality. When I got to be in Hustlers, it was huge for me because it didn't have anything to do with being trans. I know India Moore was also in Queen and Slim, and that was huge to see two trans actresses in two major films. That community, it was a big deal. The girls were like, wow, we can dream bigger. I go over to American Horror Story and not only get to have a main series regular role, but that had nothing to do with being trans. I honestly believe that we are arriving at a new way of telling stories. I just want to be treated like a human, and I really think that that's what a lot of trans and non-binary actors want, is just to be accepted. While trans roles in mainstream media are expanding, the daily danger trans people face off screen remains all too real. I was just walking in a park on a Saturday, you know, with my friend and we're attacked. And so this, we gotta change the culture. That is a huge part of the work. Laverne's attacker fled before police could respond. So no charges were filed. Three days after Cox was harassed, Actor Elliot Page released a statement declaring he was transgender and pledging to use his position of power and influence to further the cause of transgender people everywhere. It is so important that we come together as a community, especially in this really weird, volatile time that we live in, and that because we are such a minority, we will never get anywhere without the majority helping us. There has been a shift towards an authentic curiosity in the lives of trans people that goes beyond our body parts, that goes beyond our tragedy, and that is starting to break through those stereotypes. We're becoming a part of a community that didn't know how to deal with us. And so I think that's amazing. It makes me realize that it's only gonna get better and bigger.